Hello, welcome back after lunch. Hope you had a good lunch. Um, this is the session number four, Cultures. We're looking at promoting diversity, inclusion and openness. I'm Patricia Kingori. I'm going to be the chair this afternoon. I'm Associate Professor of Sociology and Global Health Ethics at the University of Oxford at the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities. Um, I've been given a four-year Wellcome Trust uh, funded project looking at fakes, fabrications and falsehoods in global health. And part of that work is to look at concerns around fakery in knowledge production, so particularly um, predatory journals and shadow scholars. So these are the people who write essays and publications on behalf of other people. And so I've been listening with great interest um, as to all, to all the weight given on publications, knowing that uh, so many of them are written by others. Um, this afternoon, we've got uh, four really great uh, speakers and contributions. We've got um, Stephen Curry. Uh, he is uh, Assistant Provost for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. Apparently he's known to many of you. Um, he's at from Imperial College. Um, there's also Molly King, another sociologist. I'm very happy she's here. She's Assistant Professor um, at Santa Clara University. And we've got Jean-Claude Bergerman, and he's going to be uh, talking uh, later in his role as advisor to the Open Access Envoy. Um, uh, that, that's at the European Commission. And then we've got uh, our discussant, Jennifer Rubin, and uh, she's going to be talking from her position as Executive Chair of the um, ESRC and the UK Research and Innovation Executive Champion for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. So I'm just going to start off with inviting Stephen to come up. Thank you. We are here to talk about uh, how uh, research on research can help to inform and accelerate positive changes in research culture. So we want to talk about uh, cultures. Uh, I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit. I spent the first 30 years of my research career as a structural biologist, so I have been studying uh, protein molecules and other macromolecules, which are extraordinarily complex um, entities consisting of thousands of atoms. Uh, but in the last 10 years, I have sort of moved uh, a little bit more in my extracurricular activity into a world which is far more complex uh, and difficult and for which there are, as we've been hearing this morning, um, not ready-made um, solutions. So I want to offer a few personal, philosophical and practical uh, reflections in this space uh, to borrow some of um, the terminology we heard this morning. I'm hopefully a, a bit of a disruptive alien in this space. I don't consider myself a professional uh, in any uh, uh, sense of it. To um, recall the immortal words of the teapot in Disney's Beauty and the Beast, this is a tale as old as time. And I think what we're talking about here is really about recovering and thinking about what it is that we value as a research community and as a research community that are uh, hopefully fully embedded members of society. So um, Keenan Malik, in his wonderful book on the sort of history of moral philosophy, identifies an important transition that happened, I think, largely in Europe during the Enlightenment, which was thinking about the, uh, the sort of scope for uh, morality and ethics um, in the world, which where there was a transition from thinking that you know, the world was just made in a certain way and you had to live with it and do the best that you could, to actually people starting to think that actually they could change the world. There was things that they could do they didn't have to accept uh, the status quo. They didn't have to accept the idea, for example, that you know slavery was a thing and uh, we've been doing it for uh, uh, hundreds of years and there was no way that we could ever possibly do without it. And so we are thinking about how it is that we can change things. Malik cites uh, the uh, neuroscientist and neuropsychiatrist Viktor Frankl, who survived uh, the Holocaust. Don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. That's a message for the metrics people in the room. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued, it must ensue, and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's dedication to a cause greater than oneself. And I hope that's a message that it certainly resonates with me, and I hope it resonates with everybody in this room who is a human being. But if you are a vice chancellor of a university, you might say, <laughs> That, you know, totally get that. It's a very fine sentiment. How do I use that to run my university? Or if you're a funder, how do I do that to get the best research? And so the question we're really trying to grapple with, I think, is how do we operationalize our moral purpose? 
And this is, I think, the, the very creation of this institute, I think, is partly in recognition that this is a question that certainly within the research community has uh, risen more and more to the fore uh, in recent years. And it's one that we really do have to grapple with because we are um, missing the target uh, in terms of that um, quite a bit. And this is situated, I think, in a broader problem that I think we have seen in the West that's been discussed, I think, very acutely and astutely uh, by the philosopher Michael Sandel, uh, which is talking about the problems that, you know, here this is a talk about uh, a new politics of hope, which he gave at the RSA last um, December. Now, he's talking about the present political troubles that we have with regard to Brexit in the UK, Trumpism, uh, but also pop the rise of populism in many other parts of the world. And there is this disconnect between what politics has promised and what people are experiencing in their lives. And part of the problem is, is that the faith in market mechanisms, which has tended to displace thinking about you know, morality and what constitutes um, a public good. You know, the tendency of governing elites to drain public discourse of substantive moral argument and treat ideologically contestable questions as if they are matters of economic efficiency. He's talking about politics in the round here, but I think uh, that sentiment applies equally to our deliberations on what research is for and what the purpose of it is. And his conclusion is, you know, we need to begin to tell stories that frame politics around genuine appreciation of social recognition for contributions to the common life, collective well-being, things that go beyond the market, uh, how or how the market defines our contribution. And here in this room, we know exactly how the market defines our contributions uh, towards academia. We have submitted ourselves to the tyranny of metrics, as uh, Jert Muller would put in his uh, fascinating uh, book. And we've seen... Uh, you know, where that's got us to. There's been much discussion. I won't go over the history of, uh, of these various reports. I commend them to you. Um, uh, but everybody in the room is familiar with the arguments that are rehearsed. But we really have to go beyond these arguments. And that's why I hope research on research will really lead to real world impact, uh, real change in the way it is that we uh, do things. We've seen recognition from that here, uh, from the institution that we are uh, is helping to host this, and is obviously one of the key partners in uh, Rory. So uh, this is a blog post from just a couple of weeks ago, in which uh, it's a bit of a mea culpa, I guess, from Director Jeremy Farah, saying that our relentless focus on excellence actually has had some pretty bad unintended effects. We know about the, all the perversities that are associated with chase for metrics, but we are thinking more and more, thankfully, about the negative impacts that it has on the people uh, that are doing that research. We've heard this morning about the precarious natures of many of their careers. Uh, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to ensure that people can actually have rich, fulfilling lives doing research and aren't relentlessly stressed by a system that is um, endlessly, endlessly uh, hyper-competitive? So I was talking about this um, at Trinity College Dublin uh, a couple of weeks ago that we were invited to um, a sort of one day symposium on open scholarship. Uh, and there, um, you know, the, the, the message I gave in my talk, which ran massively over time, not a good indicator for today, uh, was that, you know, everything is connected. You know, we're, they're talking about research impact, they're talking about evaluation, open scholarship, uh, DORA, which I'm uh, uh, chair of, talking about the role of funding agencies and then the impact on research culture. And all of these strands are really interconnected. And that's why my talk's overrun, is because this stuff is really so complicated. And I haven't figured it out yet, and I, I don't think any of us actually really have. But I do have a hypothesis to start with, uh, and which is uh, increasingly, I think, and I think I'm picking up on a strand of research that actually others um, have developed here. Openness really is the key to reform in research evaluation. We've seen that in the thinking that underpins Plan S, for example. And also, I think, increasingly to bringing equality, diversity, and inclusion um, to the core of our thinking and everything that we do um, as an academy that is situated in the real world and hopefully looking outward to that real world and inviting uh, people into it. So I think there's a powerful argument we can make, and clearly there is a rising tide of um, 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 positive orientation towards openness. It started with open access, um, and now we're seeing many offshoots of that, the rise of preprints in the life sciences, uh, encouragement for open peer review, the idea that open access gives worldwide scrutiny and helps us deal to some extent with the problems of reliability that we heard about this morning, or the, the automatic assumption that if you're sharing your papers, then yes, of course, you've got to share your data as well, even though clearly there are big technical challenges to do with that. And then the idea that actually openness 
also leads to better impact um, on the real world. And ultimately, that is what many um, people are looking to achieve. But it's not just about putting your papers and putting your data on some web server somewhere and then saying to the world, here you go, knock yourselves out. Uh, I am broadcasting to you the fruits of my genius and my labors. Uh, you do with it what you will. And I think the, the, um, the insight, which actually I'm stealing from James Burke, uh, which nobody had heard of James Burke in Trinity College Dublin. I, I was disappointed to learn, but the, th the main thing, it seems to me, he wrote back in 1985, is to remember that technology manufactures not gadgets, but social change. And I think that's what we're beginning to see with the rise of open access and the orientation towards open science. It's changing our relationship, not just with our own papers, but with the society at large, and forcing us to rethink what it is we uh, mean truly by openness. You know, and asking questions such as, you know, how should the academy think about uh, democratic ac accountability, freedom and responsibility? And we heard that issue touched on this morning by the uh, uh, Indian uh, science advisor. And then also, you know, how open really is the academy for public inquiry? Because really openness isn't about broadcasting. It's about encouraging and facilitating and welcoming um, a two-way conversation with all the stakeholders, all the constituents, all the people who stand to benefit um, from what it is that we do. And uh, there's more um, even uh, beyond that in thinking about, you know, if we're opening the doors of the academy and thinking about talking to other people, then we also then have to think about um, other issues of equality and inclusion. Who is it we let into the academy? And there's a fascinating project which is led by Cameron Nealon. Hi, Cameron, he's in the room somewhere, uh, at Curtin University in Western Australia, which is uh, rethinking sort of universities as open knowledge um, institutions. And um, the whole discourse around openness, open access, and open scholarship has, you know, in the short term, raised questions about socioeconomic equity. If we're fixated on article processing charges, then that's just reinforcing economic inequities that already exist between the North and the South. And we are hopefully uh, striving towards a system that is going to um, dismantle those inequities and not reinforce them. Um, we have to think about who gets into the academy. Uh, and th that raises issues of equality, diversity, and inclusion, uh, and realizing and thinking how it is that you know that inclusion is actually going to enrich and change um, the research questions that we ask, which are currently, of course, largely framed by people who look like and sound like me. So you know we do need to do. Um, some metrics, we do need to do some measurement of research, you know, if we are going to be analytical about this. Um, but, you know, we need to think much more broadly about how we define success. And this is a, a vision that I would like to put before you, which I think is uh, largely shared by DORA. <coughs> so we want reliable, rapidly communicated, accessible, high quality research. We want researchers who collaborate, who think about um, their uh, group members and colleagues. And we want a research system that values the people within it, cares about their quality of life, because uh, we don't care nearly enough about that at the moment, and seeks out the creative vigor of diversity. Now, that is not going to happen all by itself, however high-minded uh, we all might be and how we might recognize the value of working towards something that is greater than oneself. So there's lots of ways that we can do it, and there are lots of questions around the research on research that I think are uh, valuable in driving forward um, that agenda. At DORA, we are not just about beating people over the head uh, for the misusing journal impact factors. We uh, are like to think that we're actually much more positive than that, and an awful lot of the work that we've done in the last 18 months is really about trying to think about and equip people with the tools and processes to do a job of research assessment that is robust, but it is actually more broadly based, that thinks about biases in the system, for example, but is also then thinking about, you know, what are the other outputs, not just the paper, uh, damn it, uh, that are valuable to society. Um, and of course, there are many other people working on similar um, goals in this space. We're very happy to collaborate with them, uh, but this is something I think that uh, Rory will also really want to uh, get into. Um, uh, the questions of equality, diversity, and inclusion are on the rise at universities. I'm very pleased to see this is our uh, recently published strategy. It's just a year old now uh, at Imperial College, but it's our first strategy uh, on EDI. Uh, inclusive excellence. Uh, you have to put the word excellence in any document that you publish at Imperial College, uh, but hopefully the idea of joining with inclusivity doesn't automatically create an oxymoron. Uh, but you know, we do recognize, and the sort of key statement in the strategy uh, is you know, we will integrate EDI into all management processes. Now, 
We have not achieved that yet, and I am under no illusions that there is uh, not a huge amount of work to do to realize um, that vision. But I still do meet colleagues who tell me that the fact that 25% of uh, professors in the UK or across Europe are women is the natural state of affairs because women choose to opt out and good for them for doing so. And I think uh, we do need, to, there is an evidence base to challenge that kind of troglodyte view, uh, but I think we need more and more of it. And I think one of the tasks really again for research and research, and this comes back to my question this morning, is about making sure that the researchers get to hear about this research because we're not going to change their minds and um, without convincing them with um, good evidence. I'll just put in a small plug for a Leru paper that we published uh, just last week, and we'll happily share these slides uh, so you can follow the links. One key question that's been on my mind an awful lot in sort of thinking about this space is, um, you know, how do we have competition without hyper-competition? We live in the real world, okay? It's not going to be all wine and roses. We can't just say, let's just give every money, give money to everybody who asks for it. But the world doesn't work that way. Okay, there's going to be some sort of competition, but I think many people recognize we have really gone the whole hog, and now we have a system that's under tremendous strain. Uh, this is an old blog post from 2011, actually, which was stimulated in part by a former director of the Wellcome Trust, uh, when he re sort of reoriented the funding scheme to focus fewer grants on uh, fewer people, supposedly in don't say this, in the quest for more Nobel Prizes for the Wellcome Trust, who, who, who can possibly say? Uh, but uh, there was a homogenization of the research funding landscape as a result of that. In my mind, it was not necessarily a healthy move, even though I think stability in funding is, is really important. My alternative proposal was that you know, anyone who's got a faculty position at a UK university should have a long-term funded postdoctoral position or senior technician, and that that would reduce some of the sort of stresses and strains of the hyper-competitive system that here in the UK uh, we have got ourselves into. So there, there is a question here. I don't know if that's the answer or if that's the optimal solution, but again, one question is, you know, how do we figure out what is the optimal way to fund science? We heard some very interesting observations on disruption and the different sizes of teams um, this morning um, uh, from Chicago. Um, I'm quite into the idea of teams. We had this fantastic talk at Imperial um, by one of our PhD students, uh, Nadia Solomon, uh, who has the distinction of being a PhD student who used to be a captain in the British Army. And let me tell you, she gave a fantastic talk telling us that the British Army teaches people about leadership far better than academia does. You know, in academia, we, t we talk about creating heroes and loners and the genius who will solve all the world's problems. And we really need to do need to think more um, about teams. And that's a theme that's picked up also by Margaret Heffernan, whose work I would uh, recommend to you. Her book, A Bigger Prize, is really rethinking how um, over-competition is actually ultimately self-defeating. Um, how do we translate the intellectual hollowness at the heart of university league tables into action? Okay, I think there is a rising uh, tide and clamor um, of criticism of these, um, these schemes, but they are an instrument that drives an awful lot of action at the top tiers of uh, universities. I am gonna shut up in a minute. Um, and I would like Rory to take this on and to really do it. How do we solve the problem of bias in research assessment? There is already quite a bit of research going on in this, but again, I don't think the researchers necessarily, or necessarily even all the journals, um, are getting it. And this is one of the areas where we do need to tackle, where we do need to tackle if we are really going to move to fairness for women, for ethnic minorities, for all underrepresented um, groups. This is a rather utopian vision. Um, there's a very really useful book called Utopia for Realists. Uh, Rutger Bregman's uh, uh, prescription is, to change the world, we have to be unrealistic, unreasonable, and impossible. Well, yes, I agree with that, but I do think we also probably need to be realistic, uh, reasonable, and think about what it is that we can do. It's one um, step at a time. So I am much more with Atul Gawande, and it's people talking to people, and I have talked to you for long enough, and I will shut up now. Thank you very much. <laughs> at Santa Clara University, which is in California. Today I'll be presenting some of my co-authored work where I examine gender differences in self-citation patterns and in authorship order patterns. Uh, we also, so in doing this, we examine 
patterns and scholarly credit for the creation of new knowledge. Uh, so before I get started, I want to acknowledge my co-authors on this work and my funding sources as well as our data. So my co-authors for this are Carl Bergstrom, Shelley Carell, Jennifer Jackett, and Jevin West. And Carl Bergstrom and I both received funding from the National Science Foundation, and we thank the JSTOR scholarly database for our data. So why I care about academic publishing? Um, we look at this for three reasons. Uh, first, it's the primary product of sort of the gendered production of knowledge, uh, which is how we think about it as a sociologist. And given the importance of metrics in, in the scholarly influence in academic hiring, promotion, and salaries, uh, gender differences in citation patterns shed light on persisting gender inequalities in this realm. And then as a social scientist, it serves as a useful model for gender inequality in evaluation and promotion and workplace advancement. Uh, so that helps me advance the theory in my field. Uh, why study self-citation? So we know that papers written by women authors receive fewer citations, and this is a puzzle that I want to know why. Fewer citations to female authored papers could be due in part to gender differences in self-citation. Uh, because self-citation actually influences later citations from other authors as well. Uh, so this has a sort of additional effect later on. Uh, so the data we use for this project come from JSTOR, which is a large repository of scholarly publications, uh, mostly in the humanities and social sciences, but uh, across all academic fields. So. It has over 8 million documents, but what we look at specifically are a large component of articles that are connected to each other through citations. And this includes 1.7 million of these documents. And this visualization that you can see here uh, is from <coughs> eigenfactor.org, which is the brainchild of my collaborators, Jevin West and Carl Bergstrom. And you can play with a number of these visualizations yourself on their website. So our unit of analysis is this concept of an authorship. And an authorship is a person and a paper on which that person is an author. Uh, so if I've written more than one paper that's in the JSTOR database, I have more than one authorship in that data set. So, uh, so what that means, we take a look first at author order on papers. And this set of graphs shows how gender relates to authorship order within JSTOR. The vertical axis shows the percentage of women present in each authorship position on the horizontal axis. The top panel shows about 900 million authorships prior to 1990. And the bottom panel here shows 1.1 million authorships from 1990 to 2011. In these decades, women are no longer severely underrepresented as first author, as you can see. Um, but they are increasingly underrepresented as last author. Uh, what you don't see here is that they're also underrepresented as sole author if a paper has no, no co-authors. So the solid line indicates the overall frequency of women in the JSTOR network. Uh, so this is where we would expect to see the points representing the actual percentage of women if there were gender parity in the data set. Uh, so we also analyzed author order broken down by individual fields, if you're interested. Uh, so for example, you might go on and see the author order data by in mathematics where, uh, where it's alphabetical, for instance, and you would see that there actually these patterns don't persist in mathematics. Um, uh, and I'm happy to discuss that more in Q&A if anyone's interested. So our second paper looks at gender differences in author-to-author self-citations. And our data are best illustrated with an example. So suppose that a trio of authors, uh, such as Pooja, Colin, and John, co-author with another, um, or they co-author with each other, and they cite another paper in their paper. And only one of these authors overlaps, Colin Jones. We now have nine author-to-author -author pairs, only one of which is a self-citation, Colin Jones to Colin Jones. And thus, Jones has a 33% self-citation rate in this example. So within all of the references and papers 
in the JSTOR corpus, three quarters of a million were self-citations. Uh, among all 8.2 million references, 9.4% or about one in 10 are actually self-citations. So this is a significant problem or a significant question to study. Uh, so this is important because we find that the average man self-cites 56% more often than does the average woman. There is a 6.7 percentage point gap in the proportion of authorships that are women and the proportion of self-citations that are women. So again, if there were gender parity, we would expect the bars on the authorships and the bar on the self-citations to look identical. Men's rate of self-citation has been higher than women's since the 1960s. And before that, it was hard to tell because we just didn't have the su uh, sufficient number of data points in order to be able to distinguish. Uh, so shown here, the mean number of men's self-citations per authorship is shown by the yellow line, and women's self-citations are shown by the blue line. And this is from the period 1950 to 2011. So across this period, men cite themselves 50% more often than women based on author-to-author self-citations. So there are five potential mechanisms that explain our results. Men may self-cite more because they evaluate their abilities more positively. Men also face fewer, self, fewer social sanctions for self-promotion. And this is a fact that we know from other social science literature outside of academia. Uh, we also know that men specialize more within academia. Uh, that's an established fact from uh, other authors' work other than our own. And so this specialization may encourage more, you know, even a pr very appropriate self-citation uh, to previous work in the same field. Uh, we also know that men publish more papers, especially earlier in their career, and therefore have more work to cite. And so this is very related to some pipeline, pipeline issues and maintenance of careers that have come up so far. It's also possible that men publish different types of papers, which are the types of papers that people are more likely to self-cite. So although our JSTOR data had the advantage of being very large, uh, one trade-off is that we couldn't disambiguate authors. So we didn't know if Colin Jones from one paper uh, was the same Colin Jones from another paper, right? Or if, if a paper that I wrote um, if I was the same author. Um, however, we have since disambiguated the data since this, these papers were published several years ago, and uh, we're now looking for funding to repeat the study and um, see whether this holds. However, other recent work has suggested that mechanism number four, the idea that men publish more papers, uh, might be one of the key mechanisms. However, this isn't, doesn't explain away the gender difference, but it does explain it, right? So we still need to evaluate why is it that men are getting more publications, especially early on, and what does this mean about the careers that women have in, in academia? Uh, so a few implications about this. Oh, I'm definitely over time. Okay, uh, this is my last slide. So women's contributions to science have uh, been historically undervalued. Uh, in contrast, this cumulative advantage is the process uh, by which men may have um, gained more eminence in science. <coughs> Self-citations encourage, again, future citations from others, and new citations are st statistically more likely to accrue to those papers. Uh, so I don't want to over-encourage a focus on metrics, but it is important insofar as it's still uh, a key for scientific science scientists to measure their careers. Um, and since recognition, whether an author placement or citations is a source of barter and reward in scientific careers, uh, we need to be alert for these sort of runaway processes in systems that might demonstrate um, these kinds of effects. It's not clear that demonizing high self-citers or merely encouraging women to self-cite is a solution either. Uh, for one, self-citation serves many important purposes in science. Uh, second, women may experience backlash uh, for self-citing. Uh, but how do we adopt a field-normed, gender-sensitive, but not stereotyping view <coughs> of self-promotion 
and advocacy that allows academics to claim ownership over their own intellectual work. Um, that's one challenge I leave for Rory. So good afternoon, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, um, so as, uh, as was said in the introduction, so I was, uh, I'm now the Open Access Envoy of the European Commission. Before that, I was the, the one in charge of the unit and the teams uh, who implemented the Open Science Policy uh, since 2014, 16 onwards of the European Commission. <coughs> Before that, I was uh, actually a full-time researcher in, in telecommunications policy. So um, I made that shift to policy 10 years ago for, for a reason I still don't understand, but still, <laughs> that's where we are. And I also don't understand why I accepted this open access and voiding because that's not, <laughs> that's basically plan S, but that's another discussion. Anyway, when, when James, uh, <laughs> I can do that over coffee if you want. When James asked me, uh, John Wellson, so James, Mr. Hori, <laughs> when, when he asked me to, uh, to come and talk about how did uh, research on research uh, and, and so on uh, inspire the policy shift that the Commission has made and which it, I think it is fair to say is a relatively successful one, not because of me, but because of we were able to do it together uh, with, with the member states. Uh, we are seen as leading the open science policy, the Europeans, I mean. We are there with open access, open data, the science cloud, and so on. So when he asked me to, uh, to come and explain about how did uh, research on, on research uh, and, uh, inspire you in doing so, and, and, and how did it work, I, I of course, I, I, I had to accept because the month before he wrote a nice article about us in Nature uh, on, on European policy. And by the way, this also shows you how these things work, but that's a, a different thing to, to put in your models. Now, at the end, the, the, <coughs> the, the answer is very simple, and I will, I will talk here as a policymaker from my experience, so this is not an official uh, position because we don't have an official position on research on research initiatives. Um, so the, the answer is very simple, it didn't. And there was no research on almost everything we wanted to do in open science available, certainly not the kind of well-calibrated, well-supported, uh, well-qualified uh, data that you need in order to make big policy shifts from, let's say, a closed uh, uh, premium science system, which we used to know, to an open network science system, which is actually what uh, open science is all about. So it is, it is really, um, the, it, it was a policy made basically on, 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 uh, on extrapolation of other sectors, on uh, analogy and on collecting anecdotal evidence. So to come to my conclusion, I could stop there, uh, an initiative like Rory is immensely needed. Uh, if we really want to push forward uh, open science, if we really want to do it in a way which goes beyond beyond uh, an emotional debate, which it, some, it sometimes is, we absolutely need this kind of uh, research endeavors and research uh, collaborations. I checked it before coming here, so the only uh, topics in science policy uh, which we had to tackle and where for which we have systematic, qualified and calibrated knowledge is uh, research expenditure. And we know more or less very precisely what uh, is spent across Europe on research, on what fields, a bit less, but still we, we know it, and how that, uh, how that is related to the overall expenditure of, 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 uh, of a country. But apart from that, there is no systematic pan-European uh, data available. And I refer to the discussion this morning about mobility in PhDs, even within a country, and, and the UK certainly is very well advanced there, you, you see that, that hard, data, hard and systematic data uh, are lacking. So how did we then build up this open science policy? Well, it actually goes back to, to past research work done by me and colleagues and, and, and other people in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the commission system on the impact of ICTs on, uh, on society at large. It started in 2005, more or less. We did a lot of work and a lot of reports on, on, on uh, digitization of uh, what we call now e-commerce and so on. And we, we learned there that, that a combination of digital technical disruption and global geopolitically I and mean, geoeconomical globalization 
is the perfect, so to speak, uh, ingredients for a disruption. And uh, on that basis, we started doing a lot of field research, bringing people together, the hundreds of interviews are what social scientists would call participatory uh, observation, so to speak. Uh, but nevertheless, this is not systematic. But anyway, we did it that way, and, and on, on that basis, we produced the, the, the paper in 2014, which we submitted to, to the big bosses in Brussels about uh, connecting the dots. Uh, the, the last wave in, uh, in uh, digital innovation called science. That was the internal paper. And that led, on that basis, um, we were able to convince uh, the, the political masters, because if you talk about uh, translating your research into impact, and that's one of the ambitions of Rory, well, you have to find a way to talk to, to the political masters. On that basis, we were able to convince them. We could demonstrate that what has happened in e-commerce, what had happened in, in social relations like Facebook and so on, will most likely happen in the scientific field, and we called it the changing modus operandi, which is uh, open science, because, I mean, Facebook, I remember saying to, to our commissioner, well, Facebook, you know, Mendeley or ResearchGate is actually a Facebook for scientists, and if you think about it, it is what it, it is to a very large extent, this kind of new ways of networking and new ways of sharing uh, knowledge and um, and and uh, and uh, yeah, tacit knowledge which which we could make visible via these networks. That's also why we already in 2016 we we were heavily looking into open access to publications and how we thought that the publication business would change in the future. Um, because to a certain degree, not to a very large degree, what you see happening now in the publication sector is that we go towards platforms of standalone peer-reviewed articles with a few branded on top of it. Well, it's exactly the same what happened, guess what, in the music industry. And when you don't see the disruption, like the big uh, record companies of the past, well, you, you simply uh, miss the boat and you go bust, and what, what survived is iTunes. So you can, on the basis of that analogy, we, 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 we try to make our case for a much more open policy into um, a, a much more bigger push towards open science policy because, and that is important in, in the whole debate, not because we like open per se, because it is nicely connotated, but because we saw it as a threat to uh, the competitiveness and the global position of the European scientific industry, but also the scientific ecosystem, publishers, funders, and so on. Uh, we, our main argument was not open, we are in favor of open because it's nice, but because we are in favor of open because it leads to better science, reproducibility, it leads to um, a much bigger return of your investment. Uh, if you can redo the experiment by, by the investment you already did, you have a better, better return of investment, and it is necessary as a, as a sine qua non for the future uh, uh, of our industry. So I would say that, that it is really important um, that, that even today, if you take heated topics like open access, plan as open data, we have no clue about what we are talking about, to put it bluntly. We don't know how much is put into the publishing industry or how much we pay. I'm speaking for the whole of Europe. We don't know. We don't know how much it is in a percentage of the overall expenditure. And still it leads to extremely heated debates. We don't, we don't have uh, views on how open access publishing is progressing. It depends on the source. You get 15%, you get uh, 50%. So there is an, an urgent need in, into all this. There is an urgent need to understand how the rewards, and we all know that the general impact factor creates perverse effects, but they are not quantified. There are anecdotes, there are fantastic emotional papers, but there is no quantification on it. So we urgently need uh, more time to speak. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> and you told me you would be very rude, but uh, okay, so we, urge, we urgently need as a policymaker, I would say, that kind of data, because otherwise it is simply uh, impossible to convince uh, the, the, the people who can decide to, to make, uh, to make the, the changes. Now, given, given the red light, uh, I think the point is quite clear. We need, <laughs> we need data on the whole life cycle, in particular on, on a changing reward system, a changing indicator system, because that's the Achilles heel to openness. Uh, if we don't change the reward and incentive system, it will take a long time to, uh, to change it. But we also need this kind of approach to, to, to uh, substantiate the claims uh, we make. Now, to conclude, I really conclude now, I also think we should not fall into the trap of catastrophism. Uh, I heard it a bit this morning, and you hear it many times, so, you know, science is falling to apart, we need to fix it. 
I, I, when you know, when I look around me, when you see the new cancer therapies developed on a weekly basis, when I see that planes stay in the air for I don't know how many times, when I see quantum computing, which by the way will more, make Moore's law possible, science is doing a fantastic job. The point, uh, the way we sell it is, it's not about fixing a broken system; it's about fixing the lack, the the, the, the opportunities which we miss. And I hope that the, the center here will uh, contribute to that. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Jennifer Rubin, I'm the Executive Chair for the Economic and Social Research Council and I'm the Executive Chair Lead uh, not only for, um, for equality, diversity and inclusion but now we've uh, brought that together with research culture as a whole so this is absolutely a, a, a fabulous moment for me um, with the launch of Rory and I'm, I'm very delighted to be here and to hear those um, brilliant uh, talks and provocations. So thank you very much for those. Um, I'm glad that the bar for timeliness has been set low so far in this session, but I would, <laughs> I would do my best and try not, to, try not to overrun. So it seems to me that we all agree this is a, a really important area. And um, given the kind of many uh, challenges and issues that we face in, in this field, um, and given the kinds of questions that we've heard about research and about research funding, um, we, we have a lot of work to do. And it's absolutely brilliant that a lot of people have come together because they are interested, whether as researchers or as funders. But the kinds of challenges that we've heard about just now and that you've been hearing about today and that we hear about in the, in the wider landscape include things like the replication crisis, calls for more open and public access to research, failure to diversify progression and uh, participation in research and innovation careers, and more. Many of these challenges are in many ways pretty clear and pretty well documented. I think we're, we're starting to do reasonably well on the kind of diagnosis bit and the, and the description. Um, and many of them have, started, have been ably set out with examples and things in, in these talks just now. But what I think we'd probably all agree, and feel free to disagree during the discussion, but it is, is what's less clear is what to do about it. And that's because we have a very limited evidence base about how to develop more open, supportive, inclusive research culture, for example, or about how to refocus, as, as, as Stephen called it, um, on the intrinsic rather than the extrinsic values and rewards of research. And while we don't have evidence of what to do about these things, at least in most areas, there is some good evidence that, in fact, many of you are generating on some things, there is, I think, a growing clarity about some of the things that are going awry, if you like, and what we may want to change. And you've, again, heard about many of these today, and there have been some brilliant questions put forward already. That's so important, because in order to make these changes, we, what's the very first step, what's so important is that we start by generating the right questions. Questions like, what do we really want research to achieve? What should the outcome measures actually look like? How do we support a research and innovation environment that attracts and retains people from diverse backgrounds and benefits as well as it can from all of that diversity? There's evidence, of course, that access to careers in this landscape is far from solely driven by talent, including research that looks in the US at who becomes an inventor and who doesn't, or as one paper calls it, who are the lost Einsteins. And this kind of work in Molly King's description of the subtle but pervasive disparities in scholarship, in citation at least, illustrate the need to investigate these issues in depth. So a simple description of the problem certainly doesn't tell us what the, uh, what the solution will be, and nor does it tell us you know, what the theory of change, if we had a quick solution, would be to achieving that. We can't just accept the headline statistics that may indicate some of the areas in which inequalities are being addressed, for example. Jean-Claude Bergelman's talk provided insights into how research on research helped to influence policy changes and how we're hampered by the lack of research in, on research in other areas. So across these talks, I think there are at least two key ways in which research on research can help. First, it can help us understand where we are now and how we got here 
what, what drove the current situation. That will be really important for next steps. What are the structures, processes, psychology, culture, and decisions and policies that have led us to the research and innovation environment that we currently have with all of its attendant challenges? And of course, uh, as we've also just heard, many of its successes and opportunities. Second, we can use this as a time to clarify and make progress on what good actually looks like. What are we expecting of all the funding and activity that happens in our research and innovation sector? How do we balance and prioritize amongst these? This is about who gets to do research and innovation, on what they get to do it, and who benefits from the outputs, technologies, and data that emerge. It can also help us to understand how we can get to that different picture. This requires reflection and articulating our aims and ambitions for research and innovation clearly. But this isn't only or primarily a philosophical exercise. It requires us to set out what changes we're actually seeking to make and what kinds of things might help us get there. And then what I think is, as an empirical social scientist is absolutely crucial is, the, is empirically testing and trialing interventions and approaches and evaluating how well they're working. It requires beginning to gather data now that will help us to monitor and understand whether interventions are indeed getting us to where we said we want to go. So to do this well, I think we'll need to think very systemically. And I heard that term came up earlier today. But what I mean by this is that while we'll need to come up with some interventions and policies that will help us move in the right direction, we also need to think of these individual interventions and policies as part of a whole. They may have unintended consequences that we need to look out for. They may improve outcomes for some and exacerbate things for others. They may actually have perverse effects or gaming. Dan Ariely highlights an intervention to increase diversity in STEM, and especially in computer science, in which the unintended consequence was to put more girls off of the whole thing because they realized that they could do it, but they found it extremely boring. <laughs> so, um, a cautionary tale. But we do need to trial some things. This is not to say throw up our hands in the air and say this is all too difficult. Um, we need to think about how these areas relate to one another, though, as we do that. And how, for example, incentives in some parts of the system affect what happens in other parts. Changes to funding approaches will impact on the research system and research culture. And research culture will affect the effectiveness of funding policies. So we need to ask what are the lack of diversity in some parts of the research and innovation sector related to in terms of those other incentives, if they are. So I realize I'm now over time, which seems to be uh, appropriate to the session, um, but just a few last reflections. At UKRI, we've publicly committed to using our position as the largest public funder of research and innovation in the UK to drive Im improvements in these areas. We've committed to doing so in what we've called an evidence-based and evidence-building approach in recognition of the fact that there are just so many areas where we really don't know. Um, you can be evidence-based when there is an evidence base. You need to really play a part, take responsibility for helping to build that evidence base where it doesn't exist. So given this, it's absolutely great to be a part of this event and this discussion where there's so many who also care to make improvements and care to help generate the crucial evidence needed to doing so. I was going to say a little bit about our approach to EDI, but we'll have plenty of time to, to discuss, and I'm happy to discuss further uh, in the breakout. So thank you very much, and <laughs> great to be here. So now it's time for questions from the floor. It's the same as before, so um, there's a roving mic, and you can also come up at the front and state your name and your institution and for your questions. Thank you. Oh, but I tried to sit down. Athena Donald, Cambridge. Um, following on from Molly's talk about uh, publications, um, she explored what, what was going on perhaps with. Um, self citations, but didn't comment on the very low number of first, or, uh, sorry, last author, which was way out of line. And I, I'm not sure this is a question so much as a challenge. Um, it's often 
implied that the problems with the pipeline sit in the universities. But when it comes to things like that, uh, universities will judge appointments and promotions based on publications. And the journals themselves have a huge responsibility for looking at bias. And this isn't about how many women they have on the editorial pool. It is things like how long it takes a paper to get through the editorial office, how many in a journal like Nature, and I know they're here today, but how many of them are uh, thrown out by the editor without being sent to referee because subliminally, and I'm sure no one's doing it deliberately, but subliminally um, they see it's a, a female as the lead author. And I think we're not going to sort out the research culture in our universities if we don't really have the journals taking responsibility and facing up to it. The only data I've seen is in economics where the, the studies showed that the bar was higher um, in some complicated way of measuring it. Um, so as I say, it's more a comment for the community, but I do think the kind of evidence that Molly is producing is absolutely vital to make people work out where things are going wrong. Thank you for that comment. Um, that's a great, a great point. There, there is evidence from economics that it takes longer for a, a papers authored by women to get through the review process, and also other evidence that um, papers, when when co-authored by women, that they're they are valued less if they're if they're in the last author position. They're given less. Um, less credit, if you will, uh, for, for having that intellectual contribution. Uh, so thinking about the ways in which we not only give sort of this metric-based credit, but also how we, how we value those in our, in our promotion systems as well. And I think the same applies to how grants are funded uh, and, and thinking about you know, whether that could maybe move toward a Toward a cutoff and a lottery system, um, as some have proposed, um, might be one way one way around that. Hi, thanks to the panel. I'm uh, Bev Holmes. I'm from the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research in British Columbia, Canada. Great presentations. Um, so I'm speaking uh, 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 from the perspective of a funder who has embraced equity, diversity, and inclusion in all of its difficulties. And I'm thinking, uh, Stephen, in particular, although you all may be able to, any of you could comment on this, of the word excellence and how we are really having to think about it differently uh, given the commitment to EDI. And when we look at, for instance, um, welcoming Indigenous scholars, of whom there are far too many in Canada, but helping to build capacity there, uh, helping to build capacity across a province where 80% of the people live um, uh, very close to the, to the border, within 100 miles of the border between British Columbia and the States. But there's fantastic research on rural and remote health systems, for example, going on around the province. So, uh, uh, is there appetite? I would like you to say yes to this. <laughs> is there appetite for redefining excellence? In, um, you said, you, Stephen, you had to have it in every document that gets produced. And of course, I get it. But what does it actually mean and what goes into it? Give me some hope. Okay, well, first of all, yes. <laughs> I, I really think there is an appetite. And um, uh, I mean, Imperial is not the only uh, institution in, in the world or in the UK obsessed with excellence. And there is a fantastic paper by Cameron Nalon and Martin Eve and various others called Excellence R Us, which I recommend you to read, which is about challenging the whole notion of excellence and who gets to define it. And in part, it is about... Again, it's the pernicious effects of uh, metricization of university league tables, which tends to reinforce historical advantage, and that's not doing anything to challenge the status quo or to move the world to a more um, equitable place. And that is one of the struggles of ethnographic studies, is they're often, you know, it's of great interest to the locality, but it may not be of huge international interest, but who cares? It's, uh, if there's, a, there's an audience for it, there's a, a, a community that really is interested in these questions. And one of the problems of, you know, league tables is that they are holding everybody to an international standard, which has been defined by, you know, the Harvards and the Oxford and Cambridges of this 
of this world, and that's a completely ridiculous standard to hold every institution um, to. And so we do have to broaden out what it is we think of as, you know, what is good. And there is already a very rich uh, discourse on this. There's lots of uh, data and lots of experiments happening. But uh, I think as Jennifer talked, uh, mentioned, you know, we need to actually do those experiments and actually demonstrate to people that when we use broader term definitions of excellence, we, oh, yes, we would value the research that you do and the papers you publish, uh, but we value your mentorship, and we value the fact that you help to run the university, and we value the fact that you engage with uh, the public and with policymakers, and that your word has real-world impact. And we've got to show that you know when we switch and move away from you know impact factors and the traditional things, we still get successful science because there is still this underlying assumption: oh well, EDI, it's all politically correct. It's about letting people in who you know wouldn't have got in on their own merits. That's bollocks, you know. Uh, frankly, and uh, this is really about an opportunity and about tapping into pools of talent that we have criminally ignored and neglected for generations. Yeah, well, a bit the same but a bit different as well. I think we should keep excellence, but we should not restrain it to one category of scientific activity, which is publishing in, in, the, in the top journals. If you think about it, it's quite crazy. So we have six million researchers, and every year x many thousands come, come on top of it, and they all want to publish in 10 journals, so to speak. Uh, and that doesn't make any sense. So I would spread excellence, which, which is actually the result of the peer review, and, and make it broader. It can apply to an article. It can apply to a data set. It can apply to a visualization piece of software. It can apply to a paper, which is downloaded many times and, and quoted by uh, by citizen science groups in, in their own work or whatsoever. So if we, if we open up the, the spectrum of what a scientist contributes, but we keep the quality control because that's what excellence is all about, we take away the craziness which the system is now that it all gets pushed into a funnel of a few journals uh, worldwide. And that I think is, is what, coming back to the first question, why the rewards and incentives is so essential. This is the Achilles heel of changing everything and there, I don't think it is up to the funders, up to the, the journals. It's up to the universities and the funders to change. But I can tell you from, from my experience, we tried hard in Brussels to, to bring together uh, enough critical mass uh, to change, to start the discussion on proposing an, an alternative for the existing reward system. And I can tell you it was, uh, it didn't work. <laughs> it simply didn't work. So there is a ref refusal of the ecosystem, meaning you, me, ourselves, to go and, and, and take us a step forward and say, okay, we, we disagree about uh, the, one, the one factor, well, let's go to something else, but it's not easy. Yeah, um, I think that when we think about excellence, we think about meritocracy, and uh, historically meritocracy has really been a label that we use to justify existing inequalities. Uh, and so a, a good example of this is uh, Ivy League colleges, um, their, their admission standards have shifted over time, and, and early in the history, they were really used to justify the exclusion of, of certain groups, and, and now they arguably justify the exclusion of certain other groups. Um, as, a, as a graduate of one of the Ivy Plus, um, and so now, uh, now I think we need to think about what does, who gets to decide the, the maintenance of status groups, and um, as, as was spoken about earlier, uh, how do we leave room for the, the eccentrics? Um, so, I don't know, think about who's getting to decide, I would say, more than anything. Patricia, just, just so, I, I mean, really great question and really important issue for all of us, I think, here. Um, uh, t to me, it's almost easier to come at it by, by starting from the question of, uh, that I asked uh, in, in my comments, what are we trying to achieve with all this? And if we assess uh, the outcomes of, of the research that gets funded by what we've told people are the outcomes we're seeking to achieve, and those include inclusion, those include uh, regional diversity, those include uh, addressing problems that are of national or local interest rather than only international. If, if those are all included in the outcome measures, if you like, then, then what looks great is going, to, is going to look different than if we have 
different outcome metrics. So I think it's really important to think about it in those lines. What I wouldn't want to, to let go of, though, is the notion of rigor. Because no matter what we're trying to achieve, if, if research isn't rigorous yeah. and well-founded, it's not going to be helpful to any of the communities or the practitioners of the research that we're trying to make sure that we open up to. So. Yes, uh, Thomas Franson from Leiden University. Um, I had one small sort of comment on the research quality excellence issue. Um, that's looking at impact factors related to retractions. I don't think we should think about excellence related to research quality at all. So research quality is a separate thing that your research needs to be rigorous or, or original or, well, there are all kinds of values that we can at attach to, to research quality. I would say that we, we should keep excellence away from the whole concept of quality because the idea that you can only have research or that you can have either excellence or societal relevance or diversity or all those things is very strange. I would say that research quality <coughs> comes in many different forms of good. Um, so I was wondering maybe also to the ESRC um, whether it would, would you would be open to making even more explicit your own normativities and what you would want and what that would mean for how you consider good? That would be a question. Okay. Sure. I guess that one's for me. Um, thank you. Uh, so I have to say the starting point for me for being here today was to discuss all of the other people's contributions and not to make a statement of policy for ESRC. So I'm not going to make policy on the hoof. But I will absolutely say that uh, we're, we are up for and are already engaging in some very serious reflections about how we assess research, about how, you know, the, about how peer review can operate in order to widen uh, the, the kinds of research that, that come through. And so, uh, you know, I think, I think this is the point of being here today is to raise some of these questions, and I think it's an excellent question, and it's exactly the kind of thing, not just in the SRC, but I think across the piece, as UKRI venturing into this space, wanting to make sure that we do have a more open and diverse in all of those, the meanings of this, um, research establishment, research landscape, research and innovation landscape, uh, that, that those are the kinds of things we'll be thinking through. So thank you. Any other questions? Not even a small one? <laughs> okay, well, just please join me in thanking the speakers and participants of this session.